uh, rate of ultrafiltration after connecting the patient to the machine is controlled by, in the recent machines, by nine computer systems, nine programs. Programs that take maximum ultrafiltration and then go down to all the classes. Another program with steady ultrafiltration. Another program with slow uh, 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 rise and then plateau and then slow decrease. Yes, many patients uh, uh, have uh, may come with power edema and is in need for the program uh, of high or high, the highest level of ultrafiltration at the start of the health, and then we go down. This to correct quickly the overload we have or right, the power he may have. But uh, I, I have seen many patients that have high potential at the start of the analysis, and when, when I sh change the computer program to the slow rise, and then plateau, and then slow, uh, and go down slow, it, uh, it's more favorable. So we have to choose the computer program uh, uh, for every patient uh, just to avoid interdiabetic hypertension. Yes. The machine has nine problems. Which is a life-threatening condition. 
And hospital scale is mostly aimed at patients who have pain labels with a terminal illness. So the prognosis for the patients in need for hospital surface, hospital surface is very, very bad. And in other words, we can look at it as if it is like this ball. Hospice is a small part of the huge palliative care. So the palliative care is more general term, which including end of life care and hospice care at the end of the day. Palliative care is aimed to improve the quality of life for patients with serious illness. End of life care, which is smaller than palliative care for those who are entering the last phase of life. And at the end, the most intense and most depressive service is the hospice service appointed for delivery of end of life care. Those three kinds of care proposed for the patient or the terminal patient should be done under the ethical umbrella. The main four ethical principles starting by autonomy. Actually autonomy is the one, the main one of the ethical principles and it is the one who push the patient, push the physician and the communities to think about the end of life care because it's stress autonomy is stresses on respecting the patient's will. Okay, so if the patient doesn't want to refuse the medical care, you have to respect it. You have to 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 do it at the patient's wants. The second ethical principle is beneficence. So it means that you have to you have to move according to the best expected by the patients. And non maleficence means that don't do harm. And you have to do all those three ethical principles in a fair way. This is the last one, which is the justice. To have um, to have the end of life care or palliative care, it is a very multidisciplinary disciplinary team composed of physician, nurses, pharmacists, social workers, and special counselors and behavioral psychologists. In other words, it is everyone's business. So everyone in the hospital should contribute in this palliative care. Because this, because the the financial burden of these terminal patients, and we know that how expensive is the dialysis in our countries and other countries, this much the, the even the uh, the rich countries to think about how to deal with terminal patients, and this is a second edition from the clinical principle lines about how to share decision making in the in the appropriate the initiation of and withdrawal from dialysis. I'll just read to you the headlines and try to highlight these problems. So the recommendation number one is try to establish a shared decision-making relationship. Developing a patient-physician relationship is mandatory for right decision-making. So you cannot, you cannot talk with the patients in the first or second visit when there is no already established good relationship between you and the patient talking about how to manage the end of care service now or how to start the palliative service. At the beginning you have to have a very solid and good background about, about the patient and you have to have a solid patient-physician relationship. Recommendation number two is informing the patients. You have to be very, very clear with the patient. So you have to fully inform that you can injure patients, stage four and five CKD patients and in stage renal disease patients about their diagnosis, prognosis, and all treatment options. So those first step, you, you just talk to the patients, try to build up a relationship between you and the patient. The recommendation number three, stating that you have to give all patients with acute kidney injury, stage five chronic kidney disease, or in the stage renal disease, an estimate prognosis is specific to their overall conditions. There's another thing pushing you to be very clear with the patients. You have to talk to the patient with in the stage renal disease about their mortality rates, the complications that expected on long-term dialysis, 
and we will make the final decision for the patient after discussion with the patient and the family. During doing this, you have to facilitate advanced care planning. So you have, it is not available even in our country, but you have to stress on the steps you will go through the delivery of service. And this should be institution, institutionalized and for hospitals and community services. Making a decision to not initiate or to discontinue the analysis, and you see this is the recommendation number five. You will not think about discontinue or starting the analysis of the patient except after going through the, the previous four steps. If appropriate, forego, that means withholding, initiating, or withdrawal from ongoing analysis for patients with acute kidney injury, chronic kidney disease, or indistinguishable disease in certain or defined situations. The recommendation number six consider foregoing analysis for acute kidney injury, CKD, or indistinguishable disease patients who have a very poor prognosis for more home analysis cannot be provided safely. By recommendation number six, it's it just stating that you pushing you to discuss with the patients with like very elder patients, the patients with problems in vascular access, uh, you have to explain to them that your dialysis situation will not be straightforward. We will have a lot of problems regarding your case, and you will make a decision for them and the families. Recommendation number seven, stating that resolving conflicts about what dialysis decision to make. Consider a time-limited trial of dialysis for patients requiring dialysis, but who have an uncertain prognosis or for whom a consensus cannot be reached about providing dialysis. This is a very common situation and we will talk about it in details. Because this is one of the most situations that you are facing. Like in ICU, when you are invited to check a patient who is uh, high, severe hypertension and terminal ill patients, acutely ill patients, and you are not certain about the removal of the patients. So, should I deliver dialysis in this situation? The patient's blood pressure with all in his rooms are 60 over 30, and I'm not certain about the prognosis. Should I do my best to extend the patient's life till we pass this situation? We'll talk about the algorithm discussing this point in details in a little bit. Recommendation number eight is to establish, stating to establish a systemic, systematic due process approach for conflict resolution if there is disagreement about what decision should be made with regards to dialysis. Recommendation number nine, stating about, talking about providing effective palliative care to improve patient center outcomes, offer palliative care services and interventions to all acute kidney injury chronic kidney disease and indistinguishable disease patients who suffer from burdens of their disease. As we know that the, the symptoms burdens of the chronic kidney disease patient or indistinguishable disease patient is huge. And that's why we have to design a very effective way to deliver the palliative care for those patients. The last recommendation of our team is how to use a systematic approach to, con to communicate about diagnosis, prognosis, treatment options and the goals of care. So, because of this important issue, uh, the end of life care for those with advanced kidney disease was acknowledged in the National Service Framework for Renal Service, NSF Part 2, which included a quality requirement for end of life care. It is stated that we have to support the people with established chronic kidney disease to live life as fully as possible. We have to, to help them, to enable them to die with dignity in a setting of their own choice. To receive timely evaluation of their prognosis information about the choices available to them. For those near the end of life, a jointly agreed palliative care plan built around their individual needs and preferences. So surprisingly, when they with the patients, so this is a survey made for the terminally ill patients, and surprisingly, they found that two thirds of those from UK are 
wanted to die at home. And only 8% of those wanted to, to die at hospital. And 28% want to die at hospital. So we should talk about the patient even about the place they want to die in. And if they wanted to die at home, this is an obligation for the community, the health community, to build up a system to deliver the, the highest level of care for them at home. The working definition of end-of-life care stated that care that helps all those with advanced, progressive, incurable illness to live as well as possible until they die. This enables the supportive and palliative care needs of both patients and the family to be identified and met throughout the last phase of life and into the bereavement. It also includes management of pain and other symptoms and the provision of psychological, social and special and practical support. One of the burdens and one of the faults that have been that's it's been going uh, all the time that we never talk to the patient until they deteriorate. So, in another survey, 80% uh, of people say that if they are seriously ill, they would want to talk to their doctors about end of care. It's a huge percentage. 80% of patients will think, they will take the decision, but at least will think about end of life care. And only 7% of people reported actually having had an end of life conversation with the doctors. Regarding physician, only 25% of doctors knew that their patients had advanced directives on file. So this actually highlighted the, the miscommunication between patients and those categories of, of between physician and those categories of patients. So we need to talk to the patients and deliver the data for them in a, in a nice way. Like this telling the patients when he asked him, well, that's what's going on, he said, I, just, I only suggest you to celebrate your birthday as soon as possible. He never told him, oh, you're gonna die, but he delivered it in a nice way. So, the end of life care decision for hemolysis patients, this, this research recently proved that we only tend to have that discussion with them when they start deteriorating. So we need to pay attention for those categories of patients. The National, care, the National Council for Palliative uh, Care uh, defined the supportive care as care that helps the patients and their family to cope with their condition and its treatment for pre -diagnosis, from pre-diagnosis. Through the process of diagnosis and the treatment to cure continuing illness or death and into treatment. It helps the patients to maximize the benefits of treatment and to live as well as possible with the effects of the disease. It is associated equal, uh, it, is, it is accorded equal priority to diagnosis and curative treatment. But when it comes to the palliative care, it embraces many elements of supportive care and has been defined by the World Health Organization as well the active holistic, holistic care of patients that with advanced and progressive illness and it includes the management of pain and other symptoms and provision of psychological, social and special support. The more advancing term is caring about the dying. In the care about the patients and family is the care about the patients and the family in the last hours and days of life. This is talking about the general patient just before this. It incorporates, it, it incorporates four key domains of care, physical, psychological, social, and spiritual, and support the family also at that time and into treatment. As, as known, in, in, in UK, it's more than uh, 40,000 patients who really replace in therapy. And the mean age of those patients is 65 years. More than half of those patients have more than one comorbidities. The expected, the expected years to live is 3.9 years. This was the community to add the end of life care pathway at the end of the management. So here the clinical pathway for the management of advancing kidney disease. As you can see, there is six steps at the end 
of the algorithm only to think about the steps how to do the end of life care pathway starting by discussing as end of life approaches assessing care planning and review coordination of care delivery of high quality services care in the last days of life and even care after death in the other in another uh, algorithm about caring of advancing kidney disease we can easily appreciate the addition of last days of life care divided into conservative kidney management and kidney end of life care regarding the age which is the main issue so per se it's not an indicator for palliative care with holding it shouldn't affect withholding versus initiation of dialysis but as we'll see it will encourage us to get specific ways to treat those patients there is some factor I should search for or look for if I'm dealing with elderly patients which affect the comorbidities especially the social isolation lack of resources and surrogate wishes profound neurological impairment non-renal terminal conditions and technical precludes this will increase the complication I can appreciate if this will increase the complication and burden of dialysis for those category of patients one of the nice researchers because the, the research area on these categories now or in the palliative care is a little bit limited but this one of the very nice paper came from Yorkshire from Leeds UK which comparing intervention palliative care involvement against dialysis in patients over 70 years and it was not surprising they found uh, that in different level of clearance and even on CKDB and intestinal disease the hemodialysis improved the, the patient outcome for people more than 70 years but when they categorize, categorize those patients according to the World uh, Health Organization scale performance scale if it is lower than 3 or more than 3 surprisingly though found that there is no difference in outcome regarding the patient outcome as the people presented with WHO scale more than 3 also when they more subdivided those categories more than 70 years to less than 80 or more than 80 they surprisingly found that those patients with more than 80 there was no difference in the patient outcome either on hemodialysis if they underwent hemodialysis or just went with the palliative care management or conservative management so this has the role of the age in the decision making if I'm, I'm seeing a patient of 85, 86 years old with one or more comorbidities I'll take 1,000 times before starting the office for him if the community knows and, and uh, the rules in our hospital or our healthcare is permitting that so I'll, I'll think again this pushing the researchers to highlight four main factors that may affect the outcome of the patients and it will encourage us to think about the palliative care and end of life management. The first one is age, and if the patient serum alone on presentation less than 2.5 gram per deciliter or presence of other comorbidities, and answer no for surprise questions. So, what's surprise question? Surprise question is for physicians, not for the patient. If I ask it, the patient's physicians, would you be surprised if this occurs for this patient within one year? If the answer is no, it will encourage us to go through a palliative care management more than starting chemodialysis. And a couple of research confirmed that the significance of this no, it is very significant. And the other ratio of death increased 35 times 
when patients would answer no, when the physician answered no, I will be surprised if this patient died in six to one year, six months to one year, more than other people who would answer no yes. The end of life care in advanced kidney disease, irrespective for the treatment modality, as we highlighted before, to fully support this is a very busy study a slide. So it just we describe again the palliative care and the supportive care for the patients with end stage disease. We will focus for a little bit on the sixth step of the life end of life care pathway. The step one, as we highlighted, discuss it, discussion as end of life approaches. It's open honest communication between you, between you and the patient and the family, identifying the triggers for discussion. The second step, trying to assist care planning and review. A great care plan and regular review of needs and preferences, assessing needs of carers. I have to consider the family when it comes to this stage. Step three, coordination of care, strategic coordination, coordination of individual patient care, and rapid response services. This is how to build the system for advanced care. Delivery of high quality services through high quality care provision in all settings, hospital, communities, and extra, and ambulance services. Step three, when we come to the last days of their life, we should identify the dying phase and review the needs and the preferences for the place of this. I have to investigate it and the cognition of wishes regarding resuscitation and organ donation. And the last step is the care after this, through recognition that end-of-life care does not stop at the point of this, timely verification and certification of this, and the referral does the paperwork. Through those six steps, I have to continue support for the carers and families, information for patients and carers, and spiritual support for the services. The, the, the rate of this, um, the, we, can, we can call it all, the, the greatness of this, the trajectories at the end of life, as, as you know, it may be sudden or so by terminal illness, and we will find very quick, slow, till the death. If it is due to organ failure, it would be just suffering from improvement periods and generations. And if the patient became fertile and then by very old, it will be slow, slow down to the disc. And the three, last three types, terminal illness, organ failure, and infertility, here is where the palliative care come into play. That's why at the last three types of this, there is a huge symptoms burden and very bad quality of life. So, the advanced care planning should be taken up. This is a, this is a very long list in a couple of latest papers about the palliative care management. This highlighting how frequent all those symptoms, bad symptoms in the patients with interstitial disease or patients on dialysis. This is an example about the, how to assist the patients and how to start treatment, but you can appreciate how frequent and how hard it is symptoms. And in this paper, highlighting five major symptoms for patients with CKD or interstitial disease in more than 50% of patients on hemodialysis, starting by dry skin, a lack of energy, itching, bone and joint pain, and muscle pains. So. There is, I just have, I will go through quickly through five or six major symptoms that we have to take care of during the palliative care management. As you know, pain is, is very common. More than 50% of, of patients with decisional disease are suffering from persistent pain. The point is, more than 80% of those patients, when you scale it, it is moderate to severe pain, which is, is significant. And most of them is just undertreated. So we have to use some of skills to assist the severity and the frequency of, of the pain life uh, in mountain symptom assessment. And as you know, through the United Nations law, pain relief is a basic human right. Different causes 
of pain or insecurities can be highlighted. First, the neuropathic pain, visceral pain, something like herpes zoster, and sure bone aches and the stiffness will contribute. This some proposal, this some scales proposing the treatment according to the severity of the pain, so we can we can revise it in time. And something that a lot of us may ignore it or just go away from it is the mental disorders on hemolysis patient patients with terminal illness. It is very common to have those patients agitated or have some sleep disturbances and we have to explore the medical causes of this. And it can be easily treated by Ludo's diaspora or Halabrillo and we have to explore the medical causes also for, for sleep disturbances or insomnia. Another small thing, but it may cause a huge problem if it's not ignored, it's like oral care, uh, big soul management. We have to look for this intensively. Also, cough and the difficult to breathe. Cough by per se may be a very slight uh, symptoms, but it may cause severe complications like pneumonia or tuberculosis. Itching is one of the most common uh, complications with patients with advancing kidney disease because of the phosphorus-sitting retention. So we have to execute that. It's not a, a drug side effect. It's not a skin infection. It's just for uh, due to high phosphorus level. And it can be easily treated by local steroid creams or uh, chlorophenarium. At the end, it is not an uh, institution problem, it is not a city problem, it is a national problem. And in our countries, we have to highlight how to address it in the national end of life strategy. We have to build up a strategy to take care of those patients at their last days. And this tool step is just highlighting what we have to do, but it is not a hospital thing, it is not a physician thing, it is uh, like a policy. So, uh, we can discuss it and we can highlight the steps to start to building up this system in our countries. Starting from raising the profile, strategic commission, care planning, coordination, and by funding. I end up by a special situation that we are facing and highlighted recently in literature. Uh, it, it talks about should we start to analyze the critical aid patients, which is hemodynamic and stable. And I just want to highlight this uh, algorithm which uh, stressed on uh, delivering a TLT or time limited trials for those severely ill patients. And look at the beginning if the patient at the end, the patient improved, you have to tailor for regular breathing therapy and prepare for chronic hemodialysis. Or if you are certain, you may regenerate this time limited trials. This by delivering acute uh, hemodialysis for a short time for those ill patients. And you have to go through this step to deliver these TLTs or time limited trials by having a good sitting and talking with the patients and the, the, the nurse staff to have a good, a solid background and knowledge about the patients. Then you have to invite the family and solidify your knowledge and to try to summarize with them what we are going to do and what the option at the end. And there is a lot of barriers for this uh, uh, care to be delivered. This is the most uh, binder that we may face, like lack of consensus between treatment teams. Family has already been told that dialysis will be offered. So how are you going to stop it? Critically ill with uncertain global prognosis is one of the most famous uh, situations. And changing teams and providers over time, discomfort with use of the surrogate's decision markers as proxy. Family does not seem to understand the prognosis. Transition care at the end of life, time limited trials, and sense of physician failure if the patient does not recover. At the end, in conclusion, palliative care 
does not equal no treatment. It is a lot of treatment. And also dialysis, it is not damning if you do it and you will not be dead if you don't do it. In conclusion, the importance of adequate palliative and end of life care in patients with chronic kidney disease is highlighted by their high mortality as dialysis patients have an annual unjustified mortality rate of 22 to 25%, with cardiovascular disease being the most common cause of this. Second, similar to patients with congestive heart failure, uh, patients with advanced chronic kidney disease have a high symptoms burden with high rates of pain, fatigue, dyspnea, insomnia, and anxiety, and depression. But dialysis, especially in older, in older patients, may not ameliorate these symptoms. For many older patients with progressive kidney disease, including those with ischemic heart disease, dialysis provides no benefits and managing these patients conservatively without dialysis, I mean, may actually prolong survival with better preservation of function and the quality of life and fewer acute care admissions. Consideration of the long-term effects of dialysis must be considered carefully when initiating dialysis in patients with chronic heart failure, especially in the acute setting. As early dialysis initiation to manage volume in patients with congestive heart failure and CKD appears to be associated with increased rate of hospitalization and mortality. Lastly, in order to provide a quality patient-centered centered care, clinicians and the patient should start discussing dialysis option early in the illness, traje in the illness trajectory so individual patient preferences can be clarified and goals of care that best meet patients need can be established long before an acute medical crisis arrives. And then I should ask the patients clearly, where do you want to spend their last days? So I'm sure that a lot of patients will choose this one. Yeah. Thank you. Do you have questions? Yes. I'm sorry for selecting this topic. <laughs> At the end of the day,